in the years leading to the inevitable ignition of the Clone Wars and the subsequent fall of the Galactic Republic. A sense of foreboding grew amongst the ranks of the Jedi. There was a whisper of unease that darkness was on the rise, a malevolent force potent enough to challenge the very fabric of the galaxy and threaten the existence of the Jedi Order itself. The High Council found themselves wrestling with growing fear amongst their ranks. Despite their efforts to quell these anxieties, individual Jedi felt compelled to seek out solutions to this impending crisis, to find a beacon of hope that might guide them through the encroaching shadows. Some like Dooku succumbed to fear in the dark side, hoping to stop the cancerous rot that had enveloped the Republic by aiding the Sith. Others managed their fear through faith alone, not only in the Jedi Order's invincibility, but also in their deep-seated belief in the ancient prophecy of the Chosen One a being destined to bring balance to the Force. But the most notable and significant endeavour to safeguard the future of the Jedi and the Republic was undertaken by Jedi Master Sifo Dyas. Driven by visions of an impending conflict, Sifo Dyas took a bold step by commissioning the creation of the clone army on the distant world of Kamino. His aim was clear, to arm the Jedi Order with a fighting chance against the storm that was brewing on the horizon. However, unknown to most, there existed another plan to thwart the dark side's coming rise, and it likely held the potential to seriously challenge Darth Sidious's coming reign. That being said though, this scheme was highly morally questionable, skirting on the very edge of the dark side it wished to destroy. This path was carved by Jedi Master Jorah Sabaoth, a Jedi who was so sure of himself he granted himself the rank of Master with the Council deeming it best not to argue with him. And unlike Sifo-Dyas' plan, whose actions inadvertently played into the hands of the Sith, Sabaoth's strategy offered some hope, a chance to fortify the galaxy against the darkness with the strength and resilience of a Jedi army. In this detailed exploration, we delve into why Joris Sabaoth stood as the lone Jedi who might have halted the insidious advance of Palpatine, and examine the ambitious plan he devised. We also explore how such a plan was hindered by Yoda and Windu, and how it was ultimately thwarted by Palpatine and a young Thrawn. But first, I'd like to thank Big Boy Palpatine for suggesting this video. As always, your name will be entered into the VF Saber Dooku giveaway. Be sure to comment your lore questions, what ifs, etc. for a chance to have your idea made into a video and to be entered into the giveaway. Anyway, let us begin. Early in his life, Sabaoth chose to walk the way of the Jedi Consular. These guardians of peace favoured the mastery of diplomacy over the ways of combat, dedicating themselves to resolving conflicts not with lightsabers, but with words and wisdom. Sabaoth, with his steadfast belief in the principles of the Galactic Republic, offered his services in various capacities, most notably as a mediator and negotiator in disputes rife with speciesism. His commitment to the Jedi Consulars led him to a crucial role within the Demilitarization Observation Group on the Midrim planet of Ando, a world abundant in mineral wealth yet plagued by ceaseless conflict. It was during this tumultuous conflict that Sabaoth's path crossed with an unremarkable senator from the relatively obscure world of Naboo. This senator was of course Palpatine, and this meeting marked the beginning of a friendship and professional alliance that would span many years rooted in a shared enthusiasm for the Exgal project, a bold mission to discover life beyond the confines of the known galaxy. This collaboration saw Sabaoth ascend to become an invaluable advisor to Palpatine on matters pertaining to the Jedi, leveraging his diplomatic acumen to aid the Senator's career. Their partnership, however, was not destined to last. In the years leading up to the pivotal Battle of Naboo, Sabaoth was beset by troubling visions of the Dark Side's growing power. He saw dark clouds gathering over the future of the galaxy, foreseeing a conflict of galactic proportions that would overcome the Republic and the Jedi Order. Disturbed by these premonitions and driven by a sense of duty to the Force, Sabaoth made the difficult decision to leave Palpatine's side. He embarked once more on a solitary quest, determined to uncover the source of his ominous visions. But unlike his contemporary Sifo Dyas, who placed his trust in an army of non-force-sensitive clones to safeguard the Republic, Sabaoth harboured no such faith in such forces. In his eyes, the impending crisis enveloping the galaxy could only be countered by a force of pure, unadulterated light, an army comprised entirely of Jedi. 
This conviction was not only born from a mere tactical standpoint, but also stemmed from a deep-seated belief in Jedi elitism. Sabayoth was of the firm opinion that the Jedi were not just the Republic's shield, but his very backbone, the only entity capable of holding it together amidst the turmoil that threatened to tear it apart. Like Dooku, Sabayoth's time on Coruscant had made him bitter and resentful of the Republic's corrupt and bureaucratic nature. He believed that the Senate, and by extension the galaxy, were populated by individuals whose vision was narrowed by their limited perspective. In contrast, the Jedi were visionaries, natural leaders ordained by the Force itself to guide the galaxy. Like many other Jedi and Dark Jedi that came before him, he aspired for the Jedi to ascend to become the supreme authority of the galaxy, to become its guiding light and unequivocal voice. However, although he believed in the Jedi, he was not overly fond of the Council and how beholden it was to the Senate. As we explored in yesterday's video, exploring why the Jedi eventually gave up their infamous battle armor. The Jedi had once ruled as lords, complete with castles, servants, and legions of knights that fought under them. However, after the Army of Light seemingly defeated the Sith at the Seventh Battle of Rusan, the Republic placed extreme regulations on the Jedi in an event known as the Rusan Reformations. These reforms demilitarized the Jedi, whilst also placing them under the watchful eye of the Senate on Coruscant. But for Sabaoth, this made the Jedi vulnerable during a time where a high degree of vigilance was needed. To rectify this, Sabaoth devised a plan not merely to expand the ranks of the Jedi, but to rejuvenate the Order entirely. His strategy was aimed at restoring the Jedi to their rightful place as the galaxy's true guardians of peace and justice. This ambitious initiative took the form of the Outbound Flight Project. On the surface, the project was conceived as a mission of exploration and colonization, a venture into the vast unknown to discover new life forms and establish new colonies. But secretly, the Outbound Flight Project was not merely an expedition. It was a bold move to create a new kind of Jedi Order, one more akin to a Jedi Empire. By extending the influence and presence of the Jedi beyond their galaxy, Sabayoth aimed to fortify the Order, ensuring that it remained a bulwark against the darkness that loomed over the horizon. In this grand scheme, the Jedi would not only serve as protectors, but as pioneers, leading the Republic into a new era of prosperity and security. Underpinned by Sabayoth's ambitious vision, the outbound flight project garnered the crucial backing of the Galactic Senate and Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Officially, Outbound Flight was heralded as an exploratory venture, a bold initiative to scout the unknown regions and reach out to the next galaxy. Furthermore, its mission was also to discover extragalactic life and to establish new colonies. To fulfill this momental task, a unique starship was constructed. Its design centered around a main fuselage flanked by six Dreadnought-class heavy cruisers. Beyond the 50,000 men, women and children embarked as colonists. Joris had another more secret plan. He ensured the presence of six Jedi Masters, including himself, alongside 11 additional Jedi Knights. Initially, Sabaoth envisioned taking even more Jedi Knights and Masters with him aboard the flight, as well as many Force-sensitive children. However, Yoda and Windu grew weary of his plan, suspicious of Sabaoth's intentions and believing it to be too risky. So instead, in a covert move, Joris undertook additional efforts to increase the Force-sensitive presence aboard the outbound flight beyond the 17 openly known members of the Jedi Order. He meticulously screened the prospective colonists, identifying and selecting those children who exhibited Force sensitivity but had been previously overlooked by the Order. Sabaoth added an additional 11 Force-sensitive children aged between 4 and 10 who had been previously rejected by the Order because of their age. This inclusion brought the total count to 17 fully-fledged Jedi and 11 young Jedi candidates. He also began secretly screening the seemingly non-Force-sensitive colonists for any hint of Force-sensitivity. Joris identified another group of individuals he deemed secondaries. These were beings who possessed a modicum of Force-sensitivity, albeit too faint to ever ascend to the rank of a fully-realized Jedi. Their significance lay in their potential to birth future generations of Jedi, making them invaluable to Joyce's long-term vision of bolstering the Jedi's ranks by creating Jedi colonies. In his view, by embedding these overlooked Force-sensitive individuals within the project, Joyce aimed to take a lot of Force-sensitives to the unknown regions, 
ensuring that the light of the Jedi Order would continue even if it was snuffed out within the Republic. Eventually, the outbound flight was ready. Although it had been hindered by lack of funding and a lack of support from the Council, Zabaith was able to realise, at least to some extent, his envisioned goal of taking a high number of Force sensitives with him on board. Zabaith's main hope, though, was to discover other primitive species within the unknown regions and beyond. Away from the prying eyes of the Jedi High Council or the Republic, Zabaith believed he could recruit countless Force sensitives into the colonists' ranks from undiscovered worlds. Despite his Jedi origins, though, Zabaith's plans were tainted with the dark side. This was largely because his practice went far beyond that of the Jedi Council, instead being more akin to the Jedi of the New Sith Wars, a time of great desperation for the Jedi Order that often led to morally questionable outcomes. Once outbound flight launched, Zabaith imposed a kind of hierarchical martial law over the colony ship. This involved strict training and drilling not only for the four sensitives on board, but also the civilians. By overriding the captain's authority, Sabaoth not only centralised control, but also alienated those who respected the established command hierarchy. This, though, was all part of Sabaoth's belief that the Jedi had a divine right to rule over the lesser beings of the galaxy. Sabaoth's decision to take Force-sensitive children from their parents under the cover of night for Jedi training was perhaps the most controversial manifestation of his control and his tainted vision. But as we've explored, these cruel acts were part of Sabaoth's long-term goal, and he rationalised doing this in terms of the greater good. He was not thinking in terms of months or years, but in terms of generations. He believed that by creating a hierarchical society which prevented non-Force sensitives from having children with Force sensitives, a ruling group of hundreds, perhaps thousands of Jedi would be created on these colony worlds with this Jedi Empire willing to strike at the dark side when the time came. Although to me, it seems that such a twisted abomination of the Jedi Order likely would have eventually fallen to the dark side. If it had maintained its allegiance to the Republic, it very well could have faced the Empire if it was successful. Unlike Cypher Dias's plan, the birth the clone army, unwittingly facilitating the rise of the Sith, an established Jedi army nurtured outside the purview of the Republic and beyond Sidious's reach, could have decisively shifted the balance of power. Had it been given the chance to flourish, this clandestine force could have been the linchpin in toppling Sidious's burgeoning empire. Furthermore, despite being a close friend, Palpatine was actually unaware of Joris's audacious grand plan. Thus, he certainly would have been taken by surprise by the sudden emergence of a militarised Jedi army. Fortunately for Palpatine though, he had arranged to destroy the outbound flight anyway. Sidious's decision to destroy the outbound flight was not driven by knowledge of Joris's broader strategy, but rather as a preemptive strike to diminish the Jedi's ranks. With a fortuitous alliance with Thrawn, then a mere officer in the Chiss Defense Force, Sidious achieved his objective, obliterating the outbound flight and with it, Joris Sabaoth's ambition. As mentioned earlier in the video, Joris Sabaoth's proposed Jedi Empire was highly reminiscent of the Jedi during the New Sith Wars a period which saw the Jedi and Republic reorganised into an army of light led by Jedi Lords, famed for their legendary battle armour. To find out why the Jedi gave up their Lordships as well as their famed armour, check out this video.